Okay, what we're going to be looking at today is going to be a lot of the uh, metabolic disorders. Uh, and there's going to be primarily three. There's going to be uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, what we're going to start with is going to be uh, hemochromatosis. Now, hemochromatosis is uh, anything that can cause uh, an increase in iron. So this is a high level of iron. Um, and so we have secondary causes, uh, such as someone who gets uh, you know, increased blood transfusion, such as a um, thalassemia patient or a sickle cell anemia patient, uh, but there is a primary cause which is known as um, primary hemochromatosis. So you have the pr you have a primary here and we have a secondary here. So secondary could be ineffective erythropoiesis, so this can be something such as thalassemia uh, patients who are constantly getting blood transfusions. Um, you can get uh, chronic liver disease because you can't break down iron, uh, some porphyrias and even uh, just uh, here's the parental iron overloading, which is again too much transfusion. Now, with primary hemochromatosis, uh, there is a defect on the HFE gene. The HFE gene is located on chromosome number six. Um, and so, what happens is, is an autosome recessive disease, and you either have um, a mutation at the uh, the 2A2 location, or you can have a mutation. Uh, let's see if I have it at the 63. So it could be uh, C282Y or um, H63D. So either one of these uh, mutations can lead to things. Now also, it's, it's, it's associated with HLA-A3. So this is another association with uh, hemochromatosis. So what does this do? Um, this HFE gene uh, regulates uh, a protein which increases iron absorption. Um, iron, increased iron absorption um, absorption from the gut will, uh, after a while, will accumulate in a high level of iron content which cannot be, you know, decreased in any way. So the treatment here is venous section or you can just say uh, phlebotomy. So constant phlebotomy is required to do it. Now you can also use uh, deferoxamine or uh, deferocerox as well. So now, uh, what are the clinical um, manifestations of this? Well, when you get iron toxicity, this leads to um, increased uh, free radicals. So the free radicals will cause lipid peroxidation, it can cause DNA damage, and it can even stimulate increased formation of collagen uh, directly. So these are the three, you know, uh, pathological causes that you have there. Now, the clinical manifestations, we have something called a triad, and the triad includes these three. Um, first thing is going to be you have uh, micronodular cirrhosis. Um, you also get diabetes mellitus because uh, eventually um, you're going to get fibrosis of the pancreas and it's going to lead to diabetes mellitus. And you get something called bronzing of your skin. And this is just because uh, the uh, the iron can incorporate into the melanin and it can attract the hemocytorin and it leads to um, uh, pigmentation. Um, outside of this, you can have other associated causes. Uh, in particular, you can get arrhythmias and even heart failures because uh, this can uh, affect the uh, cardiac uh, electricity of the heart. Um, the other thing is you can get joint pain or arthritis. Um, and this is a, this is one cause of pseudo gout, um, and also you can become infertile. You can get hypogonadism. Now on lab, what would you expect to see on lab? Um, well, you expect to see a few things. Obviously, you would have a high iron level, right? You'd have a high ferritin level, and you'd have a decrease TIBC uh, on lab. So that is um, hemochromatosis. Now let's take a look at Wilson's disease. Okay, so uh, Wilson's disease is when you have increased copper. Now to understand the disease, we need to know how the body normally uh, deals with copper, because obviously it's one of the uh, smaller ones that we have, rare, uh, the ones that we have. So um, normally what happens is you have copper intake in through your digestive system, it gets absorbed at your duodenum, 
and then it gets taken up into the liver. At the liver, it binds with ceruloplasmin. This is your ceruloplasmin. It binds with ceruloplasmin, which is then excreted into the plasma, and then the copper is released into albumin or trans, uh, transcuprin, um, which then goes into tissue. And if there's anything that's floating around, that gets absorbed back into the liver uh, with ceruloplasmin. It gets broken down uh, to the uh, proteins, and then it gets uh, sent through the bile, uh, and then it gets excreted. Now, when you have a gene def defect on chromosome number 13, uh, that's going to be known as Wilson disease. In this defect, you have two primary problems. First is, you cannot incorporate, so I'll write this, uh, I'll write this out. So the first problem is you cannot incorporate copper into ceruloplasmin. So you cannot get, so you obviously you're going to get um, uh, accumulation of copper in this area. Now the other problem is, um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is you cannot, um, you can use decreased biliary excretion of copper. So and this is going to cause obviously a backup and you're going to get increased uh, serum levels of uh, copper from that. Um, so what happens when you get this copper? It begins to accumulate. It can accumulate in the liver to cause cirrhosis. It can um, accumulate in the cornea to cause something called Kaiser Fleischer rings. It can accumulate in your brain, and it can lead to psychosis. Um, and it can lead to uh, hemolysis as well. Um, so. Um, and uh, even here, it can lead to type, uh, type of Parkinson's uh, type uh, tremor. Um, so what would you expect to see in the lab? Um, of course, you're going to see decreased concentration of ceruloplasmin. Um, you're going to see a high hepatic copper concentration. And so that's what's going to lead to the chronic hepatitis. And of course, you can get hepatocellular carcinoma. And you're going to get uh, low copper excretion. How would you treat it? You can use D penicillamine. So that, um, that is the case with uh, hemochromatosis and um, Wilson. Now let's take a look at our next metabolic disorder. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now alpha-1 antitrypsin is a very very important protein uh, because it can deactivate some key enzymes. Uh, in particular it can deactivate uh, proteases, it can deactivate elastases, uh, it can deactivate uh, cathepsin, and proteinase. So this is important because all of these enzymes are involved in breaking things down. So if you're not able to break it down, then obviously you're going to get some uh, diseases related to that. Now, uh, where is the defect? The defect is in protein migration. So the protein migration, the protein, um, when it goes from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, there's a problem. There's a misfolding, and this can lead to accumulation of uh, antitrypsin in the cell, and it cannot be used. Um, clinically, what do you find? So let's just, let's look at the clinical level. Um, clinically, um, one of the primary things is you're going to have emphysema, emphysema and bronchiectasis. Um, this obviously, uh, you can, if, if it uh, gets in the liver, you can get a lot of liver damage uh, after a while. Um, it can affect your skin. You get cutaneous paniculitis, which is just going to be, uh, you know, diffuse discoloration of the skin. Um, it can lead to, as it damages the vessels, it can lead to arterial aneurysms. And it's also been associated with Wegener's granulomatosis.